Bible, I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6, David and the Holy Bread. Then David came to Nob, to Amalek the priest. And Amalek came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone, and no one with you? And David said to Amalek the priest, The king has charged me with a matter, and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you, and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there, but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. Sabbath was made for man. You are invited to stand for the Gospel reading as you are willing and able. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. Now he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You join with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, for your presence in this place, your holy presence, O Lord. For you are the one who sets time aside for us to gather together, to worship you, to sing your songs, to tell your stories, and to grow in our faith together as a body, one body in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that they will be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As some of you may know, before I entered into pastoral ministry, I spent nine years in youth ministry. And over those nine years, we participated in an annual event known as the 30-hour family. And I believe our church has a history of doing the same thing. The 30-hour family is a ministry of World Vision, one of my favorite Christian organizations. A Christian ministry which builds sustainable communities and developing nations. And every year, churches from around the world gather together on the same weekend to participate in the 30-hour famine as an effort to create awareness and to raise money for developing nations who are plagued by poverty and famine and starvation. Children from 6th to 12th grade, along with their youth leaders, fast for 30 hours and they participate in a series of teachings, games, and activities to learn more about what it means to miss a meal, about what it means to go hungry. And at the end of the 30-hour famine, we break our fast with soup and with fresh baked bread. Now, with every group of young people that I have had, when I tell them that we're going to break our fast with soup and with bread, there's always a little bit of grumbling that comes with that. They often complain, stating that they don't enjoy the soup. It's not something that's of their liking. Yet after fasting for 30 hours, these same youth are surprised to find out how much they enjoy a hot bowl of soup and fresh baked bread. Amen? Their perspective on what it means to have a hot meal served to them 
changes profoundly. For this, they learn to truly be grateful. And before we break our fast, we celebrate Holy Communion, like we're going to do today. Remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us so that we may know life and life eternal. And there were times when there was a pastor who was able to consecrate the communion elements for us, and there were times when there was not. And these times we celebrated a love feast instead of Holy Communion. What's the difference? In the Methodist Church, only a pastor can consecrate the bread and the wine in preparation for Holy Communion. Yet when a pastor was not available, we still wanted to honor God. We wanted to remember what Christ had done for us. And so we celebrated a love feast. Now, the words and the practice for a love feast are the same as those for Holy Communion. So really, it's a, it's a technical loophole, if you will, because it's really more about the heart of worship than it is the letter of the law. The point is we are setting time apart to remember Christ's sacrifice for us for what he has done for us. And therefore, it is a time of holiness, a time of holiness in which we honor and glorify Jesus Christ. In these moments, it is more important to honor and glorify God than it is to worry about church traditions or the legality of the processes. And this is what we learn from our scripture readings, which we heard this morning. Let us take a moment to watch a video clip from The Chosen, where Jesus' disciples were plucking grain on the Sabbath, a practice that was strictly forbidden by the religious leaders of their day, especially the Pharisees. I think those guys are out of town, guys. So, for those of you who didn't see, first he interrupted the reading simply by standing next to this guy with a paralyzed hand. Is it the priest? What? 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 I'm sorry, I've been chastised Jesus and his disciples for plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. He reminded them of what David had done when he was hungry, eating of the bread in the presence 
which was holy and set apart for God, of which only the priests were allowed to eat. The Hebrew word translated here as hungry literally means famished, as are the youth after a 30-hour famine. In referring to David's eating of the bread in the presence, Jesus was referring to the Old Testament scripture which we heard this morning. This event occurs as David was fleeing for his life from King Saul. For after Saul told his son Jonathan to bring David to him so that he could kill him. And all this happened after Samuel had secretly anointed David as the next king of Israel. <clears throat> after David had slain Goliath and after Saul had made him a commander of armies. And Saul was jealous of David. He was jealous because the people praised David more than they had praised Saul. Singing, Saul struck down his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And so Saul vowed to kill David. And David fled from his kingdom. By this time, David's reputation had spread throughout all the land. And therefore, Ahimelech, the priest, was surprised to see him alone, without a, a royal entourage or a company of soldiers. And he trembled at his presence. The Hebrew word translated as trembled is better translated as to, to shudder with terror. We don't know why Ahimelech was so fearful. Maybe he feared the king was dead. Maybe he thought the kingdom had been destroyed. We simply do not know. And we do not know why David deceived Ahimelech by telling him that the king had charged him secretly to meet with a group of young men in a specified place. Maybe David wanted to comfort Ahimelech's spirit. Surely he didn't want anybody to know where he was going, for David was fleeing for his life. He was famished. And so he asked Ahimelech for five loaves of bread. However, the priest did not have any ordinary bread. The only bread he had was the bread of the presence, the bread that was holy before the Lord, the bread that God instructed Moses, saying only the priest can eat. For the bread was kept in the tent of meeting, in the tabernacle of God. God had instructed Moses, saying, You shall set the bread on the table of pure gold before the Lord as an offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord. It shall be for Aaron and for his sons. And they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is holy for him, a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offering. And so Ahimelech believed David that he was on a secret mission for the king of Israel, the king who was anointed by God. He was less concerned about the legality of the law, which set the bread apart for those who were anointed by God as priests, than he was about the heart of the law, which set the bread apart for those who were anointed by God, for those in his service to him. And seeing that David was famished and believing he was faithfully serving the king who was anointed by God, Ahimelech gave him the holy bread. There's no other bread there but the bread of the presence. And this was the point that Jesus was trying to convey to the Pharisees. Different from the Hemelech, the Pharisees were more concerned about the letter of the law than the heart of the law. From Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord our God. On it you shall not do any work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. He made it holy. Now the Pharisees, they interpreted this scripture as to prohibit against any work being done on the Sabbath, even the most minimal work, such as plucking heads of grain from the wheat stalk. 
And this they did not understand the intent of the scripture. They failed to understand the heart of the matter. For when the Lord says you shall not do any work, he is referring to work as an occupation or as a trade. The Hebrew word for work is malaka, which means business or occupation, that which is industrious. And in the Talmud, the book of Jewish ceremonial law, there are 39 acts which are forbidden on the Sabbath, including field work such as sowing, plowing, and reaping. The Pharisees, they were accusing Jesus and his disciples of reaping from the fields, when in fact they were simply plucking the heads of grain, as we saw in the video from the chosen. The Pharisees, they were not concerned that Jesus and his disciples were banished. They were only concerned with exercising their religious authority. But more than misinterpreting a specific command associated with with the Sabbath, they were profaning the purpose and the meaning of the Sabbath. From Exodus 16, 23, it says, this is what the Lord commanded. The seventh day is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Sabbath rest means a, a complete rest. It means a solemn rest, a time set apart to honor God for his provision in our lives. In Exodus 20, verse 8, God commanded the Israelites to remember this Sabbath by keeping it holy. And in Exodus 31, 12 to 13, the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, you must, you must observe my Sabbath, for this will be a sign between me and you for generations to come. So you may know that I am the Lord. So that you may know that I am the one who makes you holy. In my former life as a, a business process engineer, I had the privilege and the blessing to travel to Israel many times. The work week in Israel, it begins on a Sunday. This is the first day of the week. They work Sunday through Thursday. And the Sabbath known as Shabbat in Israel, begins on Friday evenings as the sun sets. Everything in the Jewish life revolves around this. On Fridays, all the stores and the shopping malls, they shut down two hours before the Sabbath begins to allow time for each person to get home and to prepare for the Sabbath meal. Now you may ask, why does the Sabbath begin on a Friday evening? It's because the whole idea of Sabbath is first mentioned in the creation story, which describes the passing of each day in this way. And there was evening, and there was morning. After six days of creation, the scripture says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from the work, all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. You see, from the beginning, all the days of the week are described as starting in the evening. And for this reason, those who celebrate the Sabbath wait until they can see three stars up in the sky before they welcome in the Sabbath. Truly, this is a, a family tradition in Israel. And it is practiced by those who are devout in their faith, as well as those who are not. For you see, it is a, a hardwired part of the Jewish culture itself. And for the families that celebrate the Sabbath in its fullness, it begins with the lady of the house lighting two candles as she says a blessing over the Sabbath celebration. Then the father lays his hands on the heads of their children, blessing them, expressing the love and the affirmation of the parents over the children. The family sits down around the table together, and the man of the house says a prayer the Kadesh. He says it over a cup of wine. This is the blessing that it says. Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. 
There are traditionally two loaves of challah bread that are broken, blessed, and dipped in salt. These two loaves are a remembrance of the double portion of manna that was provided in the wilderness on Friday so that they, the Israelites wouldn't have to collect it on, on the Sabbath That's day. So Songs and blessings are sung as part of the celebration. Songs about the Sabbath itself, and sometimes from Proverbs 31, the wife of noble character is recited or sung as a praise of thanksgiving for the wife and the mother of the household. And at the end of the meal, there are prayers of thanksgiving with blessings for the food with the bread and the wine as two important elements of that blessing. This is the beginning and the first meal of the Sabbath. But the Sabbath celebration continues on to Saturday morning with the second meal, with the breakfast. And the third meal is a smaller meal, which is eaten in the late afternoon. The Sabbath ends with a Havdalah blessing, which includes the, the sniff, sniffing of fragrant spices as a symbol of the restoration of the human spirit. You see, throughout the Sabbath day, from Friday evening to Saturday afternoon, Families will take time to, to study the Torah, to take naps, and to go for a pleasant walk. Because relaxation and quality time with, with family and friends is a large part of the blessing that comes with celebrating the Sabbath each week. As a day which has been set apart as holy before the Lord. And while as Christians we don't celebrate the Sabbath each week, we can learn from the Sabbath traditions the importance of setting time aside to honor God and family through meals and through songs, through stories. This is not what we do when we gather together on Sunday morning as family and as friends to sing songs of worship, to listen to stories about our faith, and to share a meal together which we will do after service. It's a time of bonding, a bonding experience in which we grow together as family and friends, and as we grow together in our relationship with God. And it's for this reason that Sunday worship is of such great importance in our faith. And it's for this reason that it should not be neglected. This is how the scripture instructs us in this matter from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, And let us consider and give attention, continuous care to watching over one another, how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as we see the day of Christ's return approaching. So Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they had forsaken the purpose and the meaning of the Sabbath as a day of rest before the Lord. As a day which he declared as holy. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Praise be to God. If we want to know the full blessings of God over our lives and the lives of our families. We must set aside one day each week, a day of worship, a day of celebration, a day for family and friends, a day for rest and for regeneration. Every Sunday we have the opportunity to do all of these things. And so let us not neglect that which God has declared as holy. Let us not neglect that which he has established for man as a blessing, as a blessing for us, and a blessing to him. For this, let us give him, our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ our Lord, and his Holy Spirit, all praise, honor, and glory for this day, and for all the days that he gives to us. Let all the people say, Amen.